Welcome to the Santa Cruz Coffee Break. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on Apple Podcasts, please follow, hit the like button, or any subscribes. It really helps us with the algorithms. Santa Cruz Coffee Break is independent of Santa Cruz Guitar Company, and all opinions are those of the speakers. Santa Cruz Coffee Break is produced by the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum. We invite you to join us on the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum at SCGCPF for more fun. Now, let's get on with this installment of Santa Cruz Coffee Break. Yeah, so welcome everybody to podcast number 28, uh, Santa Cruz Coffee Break, brought to you by the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum. And this is a special one. Uh, we have our maestro, our friend, uh, Mr. Yeah. Hoover. Yay! Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. let's see. So the first thing we need to do, even though this is going to go out to everybody a little bit late, uh, we are recording this, what is this, first, first couple days of July sometime? Yeah, yeah. my watch. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mr. Hoover had a birthday, 39 again, as I understand, and they were able to have a party at the shop with everyone there, which is something great. Richard, happy birthday, and tell us how your party was. Well, there's no need to be coy about that 39 thing everybody knows i'm 108 and i'm proud of it <laughs> um it was it was a blast um you know everybody's out there's experiencing these kind of things where we have a first and we gather together uh in person for the first time in our case in like 14 15 months um and it was just a great uh, relief. Um, everybody pitched in. People were, were more confessorial than usual. And we got some like, uh, you know, uh, uh, colorful and off colorful anecdotes. And we just had a really good time. And uh, it makes me happy. You know, it's a great team and, uh, you know, great camaraderie. And, you know, like going through this shared experience is, um, uh, you know, the nature of a relationship that you uh, uh, gain when you're trapped in an elevator with somebody uh, for four hours. Uh, you get to know them better than maybe your best friend uh, hearing their life story. <laughs> and going through COVID together was really a bonding exercise for us. You know, we're a lot closer together. And with that commonality, uh, we're ready to pitch in and, for, and face new challenges together. So uh, that's my gratitude for, you know, otherwise horrible experience. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, think, yeah. I think that one thing that really comes out of that is that we've all learned that we have these skills to communicate a little bit deeper and maybe we've let them lack a little bit or drop off a little bit just because of the everyday thing that we do and accommodate. And, Absolutely. You know, I think our communication is so much better. Uh, we're, we're, we're talking with people in, in ways right now that we never would have gotten a chance to. And it, there's so much to be grateful for as... as 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 ugly as it's been you know yeah that's right there that's is right so much to be grateful for here we can dispense with the superficialities now and go right to something real when we get together with people because we realize the uh nature the value and the fleetingness of time we can't can threw a, a word on on the on on the email and um, when we did James May last, um, last Thursday, we learned the word wobulate. Um, we're, I'm just gonna confirm it because I thought it was warbulate. W-O, is it W-A, wobulate or warbulate? Well, it depends on the context, I think. <laughs> 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 it was all about acoustic guitars too. So you can't so. warbulate on that one. Yeah, we can't <laughs> warbulate on that one. It was really funny when he said it. Both of us just almost fell off of our chairs. I mean, we just both at the same time went wobulate. <laughs> it sounds like a needed word for sure. It was at that time. It was a perfectly needed word. Um, some new stuff coming up, huh? Um, you know, I, let me uh, let me let me relate a personal experience. Please do that. Let me relate a personal experience with somebody that we both all know, um, uh, somebody big on the forum who just bought a vintage uh, Gibson guitar. And he's been looking, for this, good, been looking for this thing for a really long time. 
And when it came, he said, wow, it's really, it's really, it's really great. And I, I need to change the tuners and I'm trying a bunch of different strings. And he called me last night and he said, I just put on a set of Santa Cruz low tensions. And he said, this thing is a grand piano. <laughs> and the way he described it was, he said, you know, maybe that there are just a little bit more there. It, it makes the neck feel different. It makes the thing feel different. And it sounds like Carnegie Hall. Awesome. And, well, yeah, it, it, and it, it, there's tribute. There's, there's a nice little promo to the string. So what do we know about strings? Um, that, is, uh, that is a great statement. Um, and I, I've got to say he's capturing some of the real, uh, uh, our, you know, our prime intent in uh, making those strings. Uh, I'm going to say this uh, uh, boldly here is uh, a, a lot of people, I'm saying most people don't really know what their guitar sounds like because they bought, uh, they bought a set of commercial strings or many sets of commercial strings that um, uh, because we are so focused on gauge or the size of the string uh, that they accept what the string manufacturer does to their guitar as far as feel um, amplitude uh, and sustain. So, you know, I talked about this before. Um, your guitar has a natural voice and the strings can, uh, can uh, obfuscate or disguise that, obscure it. Um, and the whole idea behind these strings is to have um, an equal feel on all strings. And that feel is a complicated thing. It's not just um, a pressure uh, you know, measured in uh, a pounds per square inch or something. It's, uh, it has to calculate the angle of your attack, depending on which, uh, you know, from which direction you're gonna hit that string, depending on where it falls in the uh, six string arrangement. Um, and so that, it, that the feel, uh, not the measurement of uh, pressure, but the feel is equal, um, that the amplitude uh, of all the strings are equal. And we, we would call that EQ. Uh, your string brand doesn't tell you uh, that your guitar is overly bassy or weak in the bass because of the string uh, uh, tensions. Your, your guitar actually has an even amplitude on all the strings. And then finally, uh, maximum sustain. Um, the string, the quality of the string doesn't decide when it stops ringing, uh, you know, you do. So those are the things that this guy just described and what he discovered in his beautiful old Gibson. And uh, 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 that, that thrills me because uh, people try so hard to hear the difference in strings. Sometimes they're, um, they overwork their brain and don't appreciate the, you know, the, the simple part of that. So what's new with us is we are, um, we've had a really great response and success with our uh, standard tuning, you know, six string guitar. And that was a product of probably 15 years of R&D and beta testing. And uh, from that, of course, our next iterations take less time. And we've done a dadgad set that I'm thrilled with. I love playing a dadgad. Uh, and uh, most people are handicapped by using a set that's just uh, you know, chosen for obvious gauges rather than tension. So the dad gad works really well. And that's, um, that's, we have that now, uh, but it's in, um, uh, I think we're just starting to get those available in packaging. Uh, baritone set, likewise, that's a very specialized thing. And it requires, uh, you know, a, a string that's made for it, not just adapted to it. And those are, um, we have those in bulk now that we can use, but we're just starting to get the baritone packaged. So dad get available, baritone almost, and the 12 string set, which again, 12 strings are dear to my heart because it was so easy to improve upon the 12 string by taking it as a serious instrument rather than just the novelty. And same with the strings. And Tad was asking about the 12 string set. We're still in beta tests on that, Tad. And if you haven't had a chance to try them out, uh, let me know so you can be a, a beta tester also. Sounds great. Well, I, I have um, uh, uh, two Santa Cruz 12 strings I can try them out on. Um, That's great. So uh, 
<laughs> and the purpose, you know, of the beta test is um, uh, we're really confident in our science uh, in achieving these goals of, uh, of uh, maximum sustain, equal amplitude, and equal feel on it. But perception is everything. And uh, uh, you, we need people to play those, get the feedback, uh, mostly so we can ask ourselves new questions and go even further before we put it uh, on the market. Because remember, our, our motive wasn't to come up with another string brand. Our motive was to make our guitars sound as good as possible. And these, uh, these strings are a side benefit of that. I, uh, I can't wait to get a set of dad gads on my resonator. Oh yeah, I, and yeah. you're you're a great. Uh, you got a great ear. You're articulate, and and I, I want your testimonial. I can't wait. I can't wait to get those. On there. <laughs> so, we've had um, we've had a lot of signature artists that we've gotten the chance to talk to, and Fun. it's it, it's really an honor. And especially with, with, with seeing how it affects them to have their name on a guitar, especially Happy. Um, uh, after all the work that he's done and, and all the, the, the pioneer and the leader that he's been and the mentor and everything, that was an absolute natural thing. But how did you come up? How did, how did it start? Um, the... Uh... You know, I, I, I've talked many times about uh, pride and and the the nature of pride and how costly it is and usually how counterproductive it is in something. Uh, but uh, in my early years, I, I want to say it was my pride that kept me from doing uh, like artist endorsement or a signature model. I wanted people to uh, recognize and appreciate our guitars on their own merits and not have to have, let's say, a gimmick. Um, but that was uh, that was really naive. Uh, what the artist association does is it gives people that would never be introduced to your instruments uh, confidence. Uh, it gives it gives your name credibility. If you admire somebody for their playing and maybe even for their philosophies, and uh, they use a, a product, it makes you feel like that it's worth trying out. So uh, in the very beginning, you know, the blessing of getting uh, Tony Rice uh, and Eric Clapton as names we could drop really changed the nature of our business. And I said before, I don't think we'd be talking today without those associations because we were in a marketplace that didn't even know uh, that humans could make a guitar. There was no boutique market. So uh, uh, the, the, what it came from, again, it was a thought, the signature model is a side benefit and it's a side benefit of the relationships uh, that uh, I developed with other people in, in an effort to make better guitars and to specifically make the right guitar for them, uh, the signature model became an obvious extension of that. And uh, I eat my words, it, uh, the signature model is a really important thing, uh, both for marketing and uh, uh, for improving our quality of life. So Tony was actually, you know, the reason we, we sort of thought about this, you know, we lost him recently, which is very sad, but um, you had a very special working relationship with him. And, and what it, it occurred to me, and you, you can you correct me if I'm wrong, was that most signature model guitars that had been made um, were more or less the standard guitar that somebody inlaid their name in the headstock or in the fretboard or painted it a special color or did something that uh, would distingu distinguish it in some way. And you see a lot of manufacturers, you know, selling guitars where somebody's just signed their name across the soundboard. Yeah. But somehow you developed this relationship with Tony that was to create a better instrument, something that suited his taste, his style, his capabilities, and would both, you know, amplify that skill as well as make it um, perhaps easier for him to extend it further. How did that happen? Wow, that's a lot to uh, unpack there. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's a wonderful series of questions. I just hope I can remember 
half of them. Uh, so here, let's let's go here. Um, uh, I have no reason to dismiss a big company for uh, making a deal with a artist. In fact, that's mostly how it's done. Uh, you know, the the um, artist relations guy uh, uh, gets an audience with a famous person and he offers them a deal. You know, we'll give you uh, six guitars a year uh, and uh, another uh, um, dozen lesser appointed models for your friends and family. And we'll pay you a certain amount for appearances, et cetera, et cetera. And you have a commercial arrangement. And remember that... Uh, uh, most people are making guitars to fit a price range. And uh, uh, when they can get a guitar in somebody's hands for that they can afford, uh, they'll write songs, change the world, and the world's a better place. So I don't dismiss that artist, that commercial artist relation thing. And you're right. Uh, uh, the reason that um, they usually put a guitar in the person's hands that's a, a dressed up stock model is because they're not custom builders. Uh, they wouldn't. They wouldn't dream of asking the player what he wants to hear, uh, because that would be pretty nervous making for a factory, because they can't uh, adapt to that and and customize the sound of an instrument. So on the other hand, uh, what we do, and the reason we attracted these artists in the first place, is we are building guitars for the preferences of the player, uh, not just cosmetically or feel, uh, but but uh, tonally, sonically. Uh, uh, just like um, manipulating your sound on your stereo or your sound system. So we were different beasts. We're a different builder in that regard. And uh, uh, both, um, uh, you know, Tony and Eric Clapton are two different cases. Let's stick to Tony because I know that's what we, you were interested in. Uh, you know, Tony was introduced uh, to me through a, a, a really close mutual friend. And so we started out our conversation as a living room conversation while we're playing music um, about our personal tastes and what we want. And that fit into our paradigm of Santa, a really new Santa Cruz guitar company of uh, being able to build what he was after. So you can see from the very beginning, the relationship, uh, the nature of that relationship wasn't contractual. It was from the heart. And from that, you can come up with a, a lot more fun stuff than you would through a, a, a legal agreement. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my head around sitting in the living room and playing guitar with Tony Rice. That's, that's, that sounds well, amazing. I, you know, our youth, uh, the 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 hubris of youth, or let's just say the the guilelessness of youth. I was, um, gee, if I turned maybe just turned twenty five, then uh, I'd built uh, mandolins with Daryl Anger, who was a mutual friend that introduced us, and it was. Um, uh, there was a total absence of intimidation or nervousness because I didn't know who Tony Rice was. Uh, you know, he was uh, he was a guy that was playing in a new band uh, that Daryl was in, and uh, that was about as as uh, big a deal as it was to me. Uh, not that I didn't respect his playing, you know. Uh, good gracious, uh, w what a monster he was, and I recognized that back then. Uh, but, it, it, you know, I wasn't afraid to work on his guitar, nor sit down and jam with him because I didn't know what I was up against. Today might be completely different. You know? <laughs> uh, in fact, I know it will be different. I wouldn't work on that guitar for fear of the expectations of every, every uh, guitar form on the planet. Uh, and I wouldn't sit down and jam with Tony if I had the opportunity, you know, because I know my limitations. So, uh, uh, you know, the beginner's mind is is some that I think I always am trying to achieve, and I highly re recommend for everybody. If you can dispense with your um, uh, with your own pride, your egotistical expectations, or showing off yourself, you can be a lot more open to the nuance uh, of what's going on, and you can truly uh, approach things with a fresh. Uh, uh, and fertile mind, and that—that's what where it was then. Um, not by design, more by serendipity, and it was just a—you know—I'm going to say it again. It was just a beautifully fertile ground uh, for the development of that relationship and that style of guitar. So, who came up with the idea first? Did Tony talk to you about 
his expectations for a guitar or did you say to Tony, I think I can build you a better guitar? Um, this is going to have to be assumptions. It's um, 44 years ago. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I've told the story so many times, uh, uh, in spite of my intentions of being forthright and honest, uh, who knows what color I might have added to this. But let's say this. Um, I would say it was, it was Daryl's idea to get us together because he saw the fit. Um, at that time, we were, uh, you know, we were struggling to get some enough recognition just to sell a guitar to anybody uh, and pay the rent for the next month. And uh, um, uh, my partner and I at the time uh, did have a difference about um, advertising or the nature of uh, celebrity associations, so on and so on. So it wasn't a real natural uh, thing for us to uh, uh, say, hey, let's do a signature model. In fact, we didn't. Uh, through Daryl's uh, introduction, um, you know, I sat down with Tony that night and he played a, a couple of guitars and he, he's the one that told me uh, that his old uh, uh, herringbone, his famous old D28 uh, was fragile. He didn't like taking it on the road and uh, um, it was really designed or design, it really was befitting of a bluegrass instrument, you know, with a really big predominant bass. And in doing the uh, jazz uh, phrasing, the solo work, the single note leads that he was doing with Chrisman Quintet at the time, he needed more substance and mid range and treble. He could get that by playing his old herringbone really close to the bridge and getting almost a uh, you know, uh, pizzicato uh, 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 effect with it. But he wanted a guitar that was a little more effortless to get that uh, balance. Um, uh, so the, it's funny, the, the D28 Herringbone that he's so uh, married to and associated with, he found not the really the right instrument for the style he was playing at that time. And he was looking for an alternative. Now, not a replacement, mind you, uh, not at all. Uh, that old guitar is, uh, you know, was uh, um, part of his spiritual makeup, as everybody knows. Um, he was looking for something, uh, another tool in his toolbox. And so that discussion is what led us to, to uh, making a guitar for him. You know, I probably responded at the time is great. That's our specialty to be able to get the tone, the EQ, uh, the presence in an instrument that somebody's looking for. And uh, uh, so we built the guitar for him um, and we built it with the full intent of getting paid um, it never <laughs> crossed my mind of giving a guitar away. So let me say this um, uh, uh, again, I'm not being coy, uh, but I'm gonna be diplomatic and say, uh, uh, Santa Cruz Guitar Company has never given a guitar away, um, uh, but there's been times where we didn't get paid <laughs> and we turned that to our advantage you know, uh, in, the, in the narrative about the relationship uh, with that, or we got paid in other ways. And Tony, uh, it doesn't matter if he's one of those or not. We got we got a return that was priceless, um, uh, both in in uh, uh, you know personal fulfillment and uh, uh, benefit to the company and in, in marketing. It's, it's it's just incalculable what he did for us. So I hope that that explains that we weren't uh, entering into an artist uh, signature model relationship. We were entering entering into uh, an agreement to let's try let's see if we can make what you want. Uh, and get it for you. And uh, I'll jump ahead a little bit and say, we probably, I think we built at least nine guitars over the years for Tony. Uh, not because we didn't get it right the first time, but because his needs uh, evolved and we kept up with him. I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna ask how many, how many different- Yeah, different that was a mouthful. <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing right now I could go back and do it. Um, I. Uh, I'm uh, uh, purposely, uh, you know, broaden my my um, uh, memories on these things, just because to some people these kind of this kind of ephemera is really really important, and I don't want to make a definitive statement that uh, um, I'll get eaten alive on because I could be wrong. Yeah, <laughs> Wait, you don't need to worry about that at all. I, I think that. <laughs> So I guess my question would be, so you, you had a stock dreadnought model, 
and you modified it for, for Tony, but the first guitar, that wasn't done with the idea of building a signature model, was it? I mean, at that point, it was simply building a guitar that was better suited to this musician. Yeah, it was, yeah. A, it was a custom guitar for Tony Rice for his right. uh, needs and expectations. And I don't mind saying to try to change his uh, expectations a bit. Um, we, uh, you know, we were 25 at the time, I'm going to guess, so was he. Um, and uh, 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 we had no shame about uh, trying to change the world and people's perceptions. So you said we made a standard dreadnought at the time. Yes, standard for us, but not standard for the world. Right. And, and the, what we were doing is, um, uh, you know, we were making instruments for the uh, likes of the Wyndham Hill gang, uh, Michael Hedges, uh, Daniel Heck, um, Robbie Basho, all these, these uh, open tuning guys playing really complex pieces. And for the most part, they were playing dreadnoughts simply because everybody played a dreadnought. That's what a real guitar was. But those instruments, the dreadnoughts were too bassy. They were too boomy. They really didn't showcase the talents. And so when we made our first dreadnought, it really was voiced more like an OM uh, to have uh, less bass dominance, more presence, more clarity for single notes and so forth. So we were doing something very different already in that right. regard. Now that wasn't the fit for Tony, mind you. Tony and uh, Will Ackerman didn't need the same instrument. Uh, Tony needed something that, that did pay homage to his uh, bluegrass roots. And uh, so we voiced it a little bit differently, et cetera. But that's, that, you're right. It was, a, it was a guitar for Tony, not a guitar for, uh, the, uh, to impress the marketplace. Right. Well, and I've got to imagine, I've got to imagine that when you delivered that guitar to Tony and he probably played it for the first time, I bet his eyes opened up and said, wow, um, you've done something here that you know, I'm not familiar with or haven't heard before. And I could understand where he, he made that connection that you were able to take what he was hoping for combined with what you were the direction you might have been wanting to lead him and would lead to other guitars. Yeah, the, the <clears throat> face I was making because I was going like, I like the sound of that. Uh, <laughs> write, write that testimonial down. Uh, so uh, interestingly, here's what happened is um, he, when he picked up the guitar, you know, you put it in really flattering terms. Um, he, he did say, wow, that's something different, but not in a great way. He, he said, man, this is really different. You know, I got a cold. I'm not really sure if I'm hearing it the way I should. Let me take it home and, and try it out and uh, <laughs> see what I think. And so here's a little premise. We made him pretty much what we thought he needed and that was the guitar we were making for these um uh you know open tuning masters a really well balanced guitar uh with with really great clarity um and it wasn't right for tony uh uh tony needed more what we do currently uh a little <laughs> Uh, a little more predominance in the bass, but not to belabor that. But what he did is he said, uh, he said, well, thanks a lot for trying, but this isn't the right guitar for me. So we, uh, uh, we went to, uh, actually my partner at the time, uh, went up to pick it up. He was in Quarter Madeira above, um, above Berkeley at the time. And he went up to pick it up uh, with a, you know, with a, a promise we'll try again. And on his way back, he stopped at Griffin uh, and dropped it off there. Uh, uh, Richard and Frank weren't in the principals. And so the, the sales guy said, yeah, we could probably put it on consignment. I'll show it to them when they come back in. So that guitar uh, uh, sold within half an hour. Richard and Frank never saw it. Uh, and it actually, it, it turned up later. But not to belabor that story, we went, okay, we got it. Uh, we know what he wants. And we did the next version of it with a cedar top that at that time was unheard of. Cedar tops just weren't um, in, uh, uh, you know, mass market steel strings. Some real innovative guys like Mark Whitebrook, uh, Roy Noble had done cedar top dreadnoughts. But it was a really neat trick to get, get a guitar that sounded old right away. And Tony didn't want that uh, um, uh, 
a real exposing clarity. He wanted his guitar to sound really old. He wanted his strings to sound dead because he was so used to bringing out uh, his sound in spite of those handicaps. So it was the second guitar that he actually had the uh, great comments on and did a lot of recording with. And, and uh, uh, so there's my disclaimer. The first guitar was a failure for him. And this is this is a good point, because remember when you were saying we could build something better for him or the best or whatever, that's all relative. Uh, uh, different is a dream come true for some people and a horrible disappointment for others. So um, uh, uh, making it right for him was a real challenge here. Take it back to the beginner's mind again, you know? Take mm -hmm. it right, take it right yeah. back there. Just, just yeah. good, good lesson in good, good, good lesson in that. And, and because all those assumptions were prideful, all those assumptions were, we know better than him, you know, dumb hillbilly, we'll show him a real guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you learned an awful lot from that process at the same time. Yeah, my point exactly. Thank yeah. you. So um, <laughs> at what point did you guys decide to call it the Tony Rice signature? Now that's that that's something I'm really trying to come up, uh, uh, or, or like I'm, I'm kind of searching my memory banks here for something definitive in that regard. Um, it may have been. Oh, okay. Here we go. Here's what it is. Uh, uh, I think you guys have heard this, but I'm going to tell the story again. So we, when we made the guitar for Tony, he used it in uh, you know a couple of uh, important albums on his own. Uh, apart from the quintet. Uh, also, he got a lot of exposure uh, from the quintet uh, with people that would uh, later on play a, a part in our uh, story and also with the quintet, people like uh, 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 Mark O'Connor and uh, 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 Enrico Correa, um, uh, some of those guys. Um, so with some publicity, this is pre-internet, by the way, and pre-us being able to afford advertising. So a lot of word of mouth. So what started to happen is we were getting calls on the telephone, because that's how we communicated in those days. And people were saying, you know, yeah, man, uh, I'd like to get a guitar just like you made for Tony Rice. So um, in spite of the lessons and pride I was bragging about learning, I hadn't gotten it completely yet. Because here was my response at that time to the people that called up wanting a guitar like Tony's, is that, uh, I'm sorry, we're really a custom shop. We build for the individual. Uh, we don't repeat uh, uh, like a, a, you know, models. So why don't you tell us what you want and we'll be, and then it click, <laughs> they were gone. Uh, and that's where it started to sink into me, the nature of the artist's relationship uh, and what people's expectations were. Uh, they didn't want uh, uh, their own interpretation of a pre-war dreadnought. They wanted a guitar exactly like Tony had. And I don't know how many calls it took like that, but at some point in sank, it, it cut through my uh, egotistical brain that, oh, I get it. They want a guitar just like Tony's. They don't care what we do. They want us to make a guitar like Tony's. And we did. And that was really the, 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 the back ass words birth of the Tony Rice model is we made a guitar just like we made for Tony. And the shorter version would be a signature model. And uh, now what I, what I don't remember is uh, talking, having a, that conversation with Tony about, um, about calling it the model or whatever. I think it was, uh, it was part and parcel of one of the many conversations we had together uh, at that time and moving forward where I told him the phenomena and he gave his blessing in, in uh, some form or another to go, yeah, you guys go right ahead and do that. And uh, there never was a uh, even a hint of uh, okay, you can do that, but I want um, uh, seventeen dollars and fifty cents for every guitar. Um, it wasn't a business deal; it was more of a uh, just an obvious evolution and agreement. That's a lovely story. That's one. Well, it's not very satisfying soundbite. <laughs> it's a little complicated, but that's the story. Well, it 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 kind of it. It explains the, the kind of the natural 
evolution of, of Santa Cruz guitar and, and yeah. how you've gotten to where you are. I mean, it's that kind of working relationship with musicians and, and people, um, not marketing driven, not, not popularity driven, but, but simply doing what you do as well as you can and uh, people appreciating that. Thank you. Yeah, the, there's nothing that beats the real thing, is there? Yeah, <laughs> very true. Well, that's, I, I think that's fascinating. And then, so you went through about nine guitars. So was Tony getting to the point where he's like, wow, this is great, but uh, can we try it with a little different spacing or can we try it with a, a, a maybe some more bass or can we try it with, and just knowing that you would have that capability and him just kind of like, wow, let's try this. Wow, let's try that. You know, that I love again, I love that. Write that down. That's a great, that's a much better answer than the reality. Uh, now there was there was that. We did have those discussions, but that was after the fact. Uh, usually the call went something like this. Um, uh, hey man, you know, like I uh, got my guitar on loan to uh, uh, another fella and uh, I was thinking maybe like, uh, you know, you could uh, go ahead and make me a, a, a different one and uh, then, then we get into that conversation. Uh. So, uh, Tony, Tony's uh, 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 angelic gifts and his demons are pretty much public record and I won't dwell on any of that, but um, he had his times where uh, money was more important to him than his guitar or whatever, whatever money can do for one. And uh, those the, kind of heartbreaking stories. And he never, well, I can't say this. I want to say he never went down town to the pawn shop and pawned his guitar. There was always some, you know, kindred spirit uh, that loved him and cared about him that was willing to uh, quote, uh, keep his guitar uh, safe for him at a certain price uh, with the option to get it back at some time, let's say. So that was the case with most of the instruments, um, but not all. Uh, later on, once I realized the pattern that we were going through, uh, we brokered a, uh, several sales for him with real uh, uh, sophisticated uh, collectors and so forth where he could get a proper price for the instrument and and acknowledge that it was a sale uh not a uh, a temporary loan oh, okay. and from that uh we were able to pay for the cost of a new guitar he made some money and that was a nice arrangement uh, that worked out really well very nice very nice mm. maybe i should just shut up and say yeah Ted, that's that that's exactly how it happened <laughs> Well, no, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's having, other, having other musician friends that that tale is something I can relate to well. Um, right. So, you know, it would be nice to think that this society in this world appreciated artists uh, whose creations were as momentary as musicians are, um, but that's not the case, and I don't think it's ever been the case, so... Yeah, it, there's a lot of color in between the lines there, and uh, you know maybe someday. Yeah. As I as I said in in response to you asking if it was okay to ask about these things, uh, yeah, go ahead. You go deep as you want or as direct as you want. Uh, if I feel I need discretion, I will. Uh, but also, I, I'll answer your questions. Yeah. About what year did that? Are we seventy five somewhere around there? Um. Let's see. I'm 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 looking right now to. Uh, uh, Fred's magazine cover uh, that was early 78 with him with the uh, uh, with the cedar top guitar mm -hmm. uh, so that means we would have built that in 77 and as you know our uh, we date our our uh, partnership agreement our inception in September of 76 so we weren't very long into the game before this started to happen uh, and for anybody that doesn't know our history, uh, we didn't start, I didn't start building guitars in 1976. That's when I uh, took an offer from two partners to, to join with me and become Santa Cruz Guitar Company rather than, uh, you know, Otis B. Rohde Industrial. <laughs> Industrial. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
So um, uh, I had, uh, you know, I, I had experience in just that because all I did was build uh, uh, for people, not to, not for um, either my own amusement or something to go in a store. So, um, heady days. The, the the phone rings one day, and it's this guy from England who who's melted his guitar. Yeah. <laughs> Um, is that, that that a dot 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 and you're waiting for the answer I'll go yeah ahead. I'm, I'm waiting for the answer on that one yeah uh, so here's um, you know I'm sorry I had so much fun with you guys I, I don't want to burden you with a long only no, it, it, uh, historical perspective pound us. so let me okay okay here you go pound us. Um, we had um, you know we'd finally come to terms that that advertising was probably a good idea um, otherwise, people didn't know about us, and we'd die. So we um, uh, pulled our resources and got enough scratch together for an ad in, in Fretz magazine. And Fretz was a, a huge change in the acoustic music world. Uh, uh, the, the predecessor of that would have been Pickin out of New Jersey, uh, which was uh, edited, uh, uh, you know, um, Roger Seminoff's the senior editor. And that, uh, the success of that magazine, which was a bluegrass magazine, uh, attracted uh, Guitar Player International, which had guitar player, keyboard, bass player, and so forth, to attract him to come out to California and do frets. Uh, and he did. Uh, and that would have been 76, I think, that, that frets started. So anyway, uh, advertising and frets would put us on the world stage. And the first ad we ran was, um, it was about four postage stamps was the size we're able to afford. And it was a picture of our FTC with the deco inlays and the cutaway. Um, and, and, and simply our uh, address and phone number at the bottom of it. And uh, uh, one day I went out to the mailboxes you, you, you know, you youngsters can look that up. Uh, and there was a, there was a, a, a little pink kind of um, uh, a birthday card size envelope. And it was addressed in this really nice, you know, calligraphy uh, to Santa Cruz Guitar Company. But up in the corner, it said E. Clapton, London, England. And I went, Huh. <laughs> How about that? I wonder if that's um, uh, Ernie Clapton, the plumber, or, or some other coincidence, or could it be, you know? So uh, I took it in and called my partner over and we opened it up. And, you know, uh, uh, just a, a beautiful hand. Uh, uh, the letter went something like, um, you know, uh, uh, Greetings, saw this um, uh, uh, beautiful guitar in Fretz magazine and it included a little uh, clipping from the magazine. And it says, uh, uh, wondering about a meeting in the flesh, please call Diana at, and then it had a, a phone number. And so we spent the better part of that morning trying to learn how to dial an international call. <laughs> and, uh, and we called Diana. And she says, um, uh, you know, uh, oh, great, great chaps. Um, uh, you know, how can we arrange for Mr. Clapton to buy this guitar? Uh, and that, that, was, that, that was the introduction. So we had, uh, you know, voluminous communication back and forth uh, uh, with um, the first guitar and succeeding guitars, but they were always through Diana, or at the time, Lee Dixon, who is his uh, uh, guitar manager. Uh, Rody is way too uh, diminishing a term for him. Uh, he managed gu the guitar collection uh, and uh, all the attendant details. And, and Lee became a pretty good friend. And uh, so we did, we communicated through him on uh, uh, that uh, two more guitars that we built for Clapton and a few he got for friends uh, uh, like uh, Albert Lee uh, and some others. So I never got to speak a word to Eric himself. Uh, he sent his messages through 
you know, his uh, admin. And you can well imagine his celebrity status is such that he can't go to the grocery store. He can't go to the gas station. In fact, he just can't go outside uh, uh, unattended. So everything was done through somebody else. And uh, um, we did have a, uh, uh, an arrangement to meet him in San Francisco uh, um, after a concert. I think this is about the time that another ticket had come out. So to give a timetable, our first discussions with um, Clapton and his people were in the late 70s. Uh, and uh, he, oh. he has a picture of us on, uh, on the dust jacket of another ticket. And you'd have to see when that came out. I think that was early 80s. Um, so that gives, gives a timetable. And he was going to do a promotional tour for the album and be in San Francisco. And uh, on his way, uh, he, he uh, 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 was in New York preparing to go on this tour uh, when, the, when the tragedy struck uh, that uh, Tears in Heaven comes from and his darling little boy fell out the window. And uh, so we never, we never made the connection. Uh, again, never got a chance to speak a word with him. But one of the things that Diana said in our first conversation, she said, uh, one thing let me make crystal clear, uh, Mr. Clapton is contracted uh, for the rest of his life with associations with different companies. So please do not ask for uh, any promotional considerations, I think is the term she used. Uh, in other words, don't ask uh, if you can make a signature model or uh, you know, uh, run an ad with them and stuff like that. So that there, there's a lot of in-between anecdotes, but there's that that story, as as uh, um, as much as I could ring it out for you. There was never a phone call from him. Were there melted guitars? Uh, he, uh, melted. I thought oh, one guy. You're talking about yeah. He so we did this uh, our first FTCs. Um. Uh, were like late 70s. Um, and remember, we, we were operating in a vacuum still. There weren't, uh, you know, there weren't videos yet. There weren't uh, uh, books. There weren't discussions on how to build uh, uh, guitars, let alone an arch top or a half arch top guitar like the FTC. And there were some design flaws in the very first ones. And sim quite simply, we were doing, uh, we weren't arching the braces of the top. We were doing what we thought uh, Gibson and Martin were doing in the old days and building the top flat. Um, also, the carved arch back uh, was done in a way that didn't in itself add any structural support. When you do an arch top and an arch back together, you're like making an egg. And so it can it can handle pulls and tensions and move uniformly. When you do the back carved and the top flat, it's like making half an egg and it wants to uh, compress the top and pull forward and raise the action. So with that disclaimer, uh, Clapton said, um, we need to do something about the cheese cutter. The, the neck angle had pulled up so much that it was not possible to play, yet he loved this guitar and wanted to fix it. So he, he um, uh, 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 sent it back to us uh, uh, through customs in New York. I mean, I'm sorry, San Francisco. But on the process, the guitar got left out on the tarmac in um, Antigua. Uh, one of his favorite hangs and where he, where he developed his halfway house. Anyway, sat out in the Caribbean sun for a good day or more and, and really cooked. And this is what exacerbated that design flaw and created such high action on it. And uh, it literally it got so hot, the glues got plastic again and the string tension just took the guitar wherever it wanted to go. And melting's a good one. Yeah, it did, it melted. <laughs> So we weren't just resetting the neck. We were really disassembling it and putting it back together uh, for them. Uh, not the kind of thing you put in your, um, uh, uh, you know, your best marketing foot forward. Literature. Yeah, but you, yeah, but you put you put you put you put the disclaimer of please don't leave your guitar in a case and uh, yeah, that's on, right. on a tarmac for a for an you know for a day. 
Yeah. Uh oh. Yeah. That was a that was a, just a huge learning curve and in, in that in the international stuff. When I got to um, customs in uh, San Francisco, they were holding it because they wanted to know the country of origin of the instrument. And I said, well, the country of origin is Santa Cruz, California. And they said, it doesn't say that anywhere on the guitar. It needs yeah. to be made in USA. And, you know, uh, being so sophisticated at the time, I said, well, gosh, everybody knows where we live. <laughs> 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 but anyway, uh, uh, being cute and young, I talked my way out of it and we got it. At the, it, what's funny is, is I have like three little kind of points of intersection with that. Um, I think that the guitar you made for, or that you sold to Eric, the one that he sold at auction was FTC number 16. Uh, and I happened to, to, to pick up FTC number 17. That's awesome. Yeah. Which has a cedar top uh, with a very nice letter that you wrote to the original owner, you know, saying, yeah, we're just still kind of experimenting with cedar. This is kind of interesting. And I actually bought that guitar uh, while on vacation in the Turks and Caicos. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> From a shop in Chicago, um, which was, you know, quite a challenge, or not a challenge, but uh, a little nerve wracking putting my uh, credit card out on the uh, public Wi Fi in Turks Ooh. and Caicos. <laughs> no, no kidding. Well, you know, live and learn. We were, we were on, on, uncharted territory for us and and all of this stuff yeah but it all worked out well i'd say you know it's wonderful as i said uh those associations um back even in, even well into the 80s um you know a guitar made by a couple of people uh there was just no uh reference for that you know guitars were made by uh gibson and martin uh, or maybe an obscure thing, company like Taylor, but they certainly weren't made by individuals. And uh, I, I put it like this. If someone played our guitar back then and decided this is 200% better sounding than anything I've ever played, they'd still be hesitant to buy it because of what their friends might think. Uh, their friends would say, you paid how much? You could have had a Martin. Right. So people would play it safe and buy the Martin uh, to look reasonable rather than taking a chance on an unknown brand and an unknown style of building. So when uh, uh, Tony Rice and Eric Clapton, in essence, put their stamp of approval on us, um, we were real. And that's when our business was able to flourish. That's amazing. That's yeah, really no doubt about it. Yeah. So one of the things I do want to acknowledge is that in talking with a number of uh, Santa Cruz artists who don't necessarily have signature model guitars, they're blown away just by the basic Santa Cruz model because it is so good. But there are a number of players who have gotten signature models. Um, and I guess I would wonder at what point does a guitar go from being just your stock model to becoming a signature? Is there is there is it because of the relationship you have with the, the person, or are there actual technical differences that you find that they want that the stock model doesn't supply? Um, you know, thank you. Your your answer actually lies in that question. Um, uh, the you know, a, a model unto itself really needs to be something that uh, uh, fills a need um, in itself. Like you said earlier, uh, uh, we're not in the position to do a, a signature model uh, that has nothing to do with an artist other than their name. Uh, so to focus this a little bit more, um, let's use uh, the, somebody like Eric Sky. Uh, you and I know Eric Sky's uh, size in the uh, world of guitar players. You know he's a giant and uh, uh, super super giving. Um, uh, people that have written to him, uh, he's changed their lives in helping them with individual uh, tips and lessons and so forth. His uh, online presence is great, but for the most part, nobody knows him. 
um, he's uh, he's still battling to get recognition. And so when we go, why in the world did you make him a signature model and not so-and-so that's a lot more famous? Well, you answer it yourself. It's not famosity that triggers that. Uh, it's the need. And um, uh, Eric's playing style and his demands for a guitar uh, really was something that filled a need that didn't that wasn't out there or the solution wasn't out there so uh uh his style is one where he uses every bit of the fingerboard and he wants you to hear every note he plays clearly distinctly and all the nuance that he puts into it and that's a tall order to get in an acoustic guitar you know without uh, uh, any electronic gimmickry and uh, and we did that both through choice of woods how it's braced uh, modification of the body size uh, even the setup on it and when we were done with that instrument it was really obvious that that needed to be a model and what better name to call it than eric sky uh, that's why uh, we have an Eric Sky model and we might not have a model for a, a much more famous player that let's say got a, um, uh, a vintage Gibson inspired instrument that uh, uh, maybe every maker that you ever heard of makes a version of that. Mm -hmm. um, that was a little awkward. Did that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Now, with that, of course, the, is the person relationship that I'm going to find it gratifying that I enjoy working with somebody, and that they're articulate enough to describe what they want in a guitar. Uh, not everybody is. It, you know, it, it's not easy to do. So, if I can communicate with somebody, be able to build what they want, um, it 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 it's a unique niche in the market and I really like working with that person those are the factors that will go into making a signature model yeah that, so so we can say to the general population that if you want to have a signature model Santa Cruz guitar the best thing to do is become an outstanding player with a unique style and be really nice <laughs> that and what's that uh that uh uh wacky book that somebody wrote about uh uh uh, um, Wayne Henderson and Clapton's guitar. And let me preface it by saying Wayne Henderson is the most deserving guy on the planet. He, he, he's the real thing and, and deserves every bit of uh, praise that he gets. Uh, but they were saying in there, they recommended making him a peach pie if he wanted to get on his waiting list. So I don't want to discourage anybody from sending me um, ice cream or uh, uh, sweat <laughs> or, or a pony, you know, if they, if they want a signature. <laughs> All right, we'll have to see what the uh, shipping regulations are on ponies. Yeah, I'm bringing, I, I'll just put the pony in the car and bring him next time when I come up. Oh yeah, couldn't hurt, couldn't hurt. Oh yeah, so, we'll, we'll bring the, the, the pony. Yeah, it, it's it's funny, you know. I was I was talking about my twenty five year old self entering into this somewhat uh, guileless, and you know, I I I do I try to maintain that again that beginner's mind in my approach to this. And sometimes it's good business decisions, sometimes it's not. But I want them overall to be good personal decisions that don't just benefit me, but but benefit others as well. Excellent. Wow, that's great. That's great. So one last question for you, Richard. Are you sitting at your personal workbench there at the shop? Uh, no, this is um, uh, Darren's bench. Darren wow. does all of our, well, not all of our, but Darren is, is really our uh, service department. We do... Um, uh, we do precious little warranty work. Uh, warranties, you know, uh, defects in workmanship and materials that it'll show up in the first year are, are don't exist. Um, and so he's got the, the coolest collection of specialty tools and so forth. And I thought I could get away with sitting here and people would just assume this was my collection of tools. But you went and ruined that, didn't you, Tad? <laughs> Sorry about that, Richard. Yeah, yeah I'm posing. <laughs> I'm posing. I'm, I'm I'll assume you know how to use all of them, though. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, I, uh, um, you know, Darren's one of my protégés. Uh, I've known him since he was a tyke, and uh, 
uh, Darren is such a gifted guy and he's such a delight to work with, as everybody knows that has had any service done with him. But uh, uh, Darren and, and I communicate a little bit by letter um, back in, oh my gosh, uh, pretty early 90s. And I don't know how old he was, eight, <laughs> really young. And one day he just showed up the door and he goes, okay, I'm here, I'm ready. <laughs> And I went, really? Um, uh, did I say something that made you think you had a job? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you're coming all, all the way out from Colorado and he was ready to go. And it reminded me so much of my younger self, you know, just the assumption of like, okay, this is what I want to do. I just assume the rest of the universe is going to fall oh. in line with me. That I did. I hired him on the spot. I never regretted it. So, so is, is he is he sitting to the side there enjoying his coffee while you've taken over? Uh, no, no, no. I, I get to say all this because he's not within earshot. Ah, okay. Yeah. What? By the way, what we're doing now, uh, when we broke out of the, you know, the the extreme COVID precautions, one of the things we did is we went to a four day work week, uh, Monday through Thursday, and. Uh, uh, you know, several reasons it seemed like it might work, and it's wildly popular. And uh, we're doing so. On Fridays, I have available. This is also going to let me start up tours again, and uh, uh, be a little be open the shop again to uh, visitors and other makers and so forth. That was my that was my question. Was um, I know that at the beginning of COVID, the shop was closed till twenty thirty. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was closed till 2030. Um, so you you will in the future um, start back up tours. We can't wait. Yeah, to, we're right we can't on wait coast. to announce that. We can't yeah, wait we're to announce right on the coast that. right now, and we haven't announced it yet. Um, and like a lot of this, uh, uh, a lot of the COVID stuff, it's it's not a light switch where you just uh, t uh, turn off the precautions and turn on the being open. It's a valve and you open it up where appropriate and let things begin. So uh, the tour thing, it's, 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 it's a lively discussion right now. Uh, and as soon as we feel confident, we will start uh, publishing the hours. So anybody's interested, don't hesitate to call up uh, and we'll let you know where we stand. Great. I really enjoy the tours. I, I get so much out of it uh, in return. Yeah, it, 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 that's, it, that's obvious. You know, just yeah, no, it, it, they're that, all different. They're all different. And every one of them, you're present and you're there and you are the, the true meaning of the word aloha is to be in the presence of. <laughs> Thank and, you. That's and awesome. it is you. You are truly, truly um, transmitting aloha on that. Aloha. You are in that. They are in the presence of life. <laughs> that's that's a wonderful place to be. That's too kind. Thank you. Thank you, well, sir. We Can have I? to encourage everybody, you know, if, if you get a chance and you're planning a vacation, go to Santa Cruz, ride the Big Dipper. Call them play, first. Play a little mini golf <laughs> and arrange a tour of the Santa Cruz Guitar Company because it is worth, yeah. you know. Call them first. Different. Call them first. Oh, yeah. You have to call first. <laughs> Make sure you get your e-ticket. Yeah, call them first. Um, <laughs> Richard, Richard, thanks for giving up your Friday. Yes, we really, we really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. I get so much out of this uh, talking with you guys and the and the residual too. you know, the people that, that uh, check in and it's, it gives me a chance to uh, promote the cause, part of which is guitar making. Yeah, we uh, we we we've certainly found. a <laughs> where, where COVID had us on a on a on a road pre COVID had us on a road it sure threw us into the ditch and the ditch has been a pretty cool place yeah <laughs> for this past 15 months yeah. it's, we have we I, I as as we've just as, as as you know we've just put everything to youtube and and everything's on itunes now and that was a, a a massive amount of work to get it all formatted right and get everything labeled properly and and just make it pretty you know, and, 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 and get the right disclaimers on everything. And it was really obvious to me as I, as I went through and, and relived them all again, 
numerous times um, as, as I w w relive that all again, how far we've been able to come because of the access that you've 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 given us so we can't thank you enough. well you're very welcome you guys are really desirable ditch mates <laughs> <laughs> well it's it, it's been really good and and i think that uh i'm looking forward to our because we've adopted the zoom technology and putting this on youtube uh, we need to upgrade our technology a little bit so that we can continue to do the video in person and uh, we will work on that technology for everybody who's watching these on YouTube. We are. Um, and hopefully, maybe uh, our next uh, meeting with you, Maestro, would be to do a virtual shop tour. Uh, oh, boy. That's that great. would be. Why not? That would, yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Um, and you know, encourage people to you know, get that on their schedule if they can make it out that way. I'm in. I love that. Excellent. Hey. We're going to let you go, buddy. Thank you so much. We have well, have a, a beautiful midsummer. Yeah. Make sure that, you can ice cream pony rides and uh, swimming in too. We can actually see shadows down here right now, which we haven't seen for about 10 days because there's been this gray cap <laughs> on us. And there's a shadow outside and it's making me nervous. So uh, oh, I'll man. go out and work. Yeah, don't, on my, don't, yeah, don't give our friends in Boston and, and Seattle, where it's 106, uh, uh, an idea that we're in this cool, delicious fog right now. Yeah, part of this moon burn. I'll go out and work on my moon burn. <laughs> I so, love you guys. Thanks for what you do. Thanks very All much. Right, thank you. Wonderful one. See ya. Take care. We hope you enjoyed this installment of the Santa Cruz Coffee Break. For more music-related fun, please join the Santa Cruz Guitar Players Forum at scgcpf or santacruzguitarplayers.com. If you have any questions or possible podcast topics, please contact us. If you have a product or service that you feel would be of value to our listeners, please consider adding your support and keeping the coffee pot on. Contact us for more information. We ask that you hit the like, follow, bell or bookmark buttons so we can keep you informed of upcoming podcast episodes. We hope you enjoyed Santa Cruz Coffee Break. Now it's time to go play your guitar. <laughs>